There we go, thank you. <laughs> All right, please uh, have a seat, open your Bibles. Please open your Bibles to John chapter 20. And we're going to pick up where we left off a few weeks ago. Uh, we will resume our study, um, which we've sort of titled, Then What Happened? Okay, so in other words, following Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, uh, we decided to continue and ask ourselves, well, then what happened after the resurrection? And that's leading us into a study of an understanding of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit himself. So that's really what this has become. Uh, and in two weeks, uh, we actually will observe uh, Pentecost, which is when the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles and the church was born uh, in Acts chapter 2. So this is all in preparation for that. So I'll preach today about the Holy Spirit and um, then next week as well and then again on the 20. On the 28th, I felt like there was something I wanted to say. Hmm. Can't remember at the moment. That's okay. So, Acts chapter, or sorry, John chapter 20, uh, verse 19. We'll pick it up here. It says, Then the same day at evening, so this is Sunday evening, the day of the Lord's resurrection. Sunday evening, John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, that's why we know it's Sunday, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Very unusual thing to breathe on them. <sighs> I'm sure it wasn't like that. <laughs> I know, that was weird. All right. Never mind. Erase that from your... <laughs> but it's, it's the idea that just... I'm going to just do some review because it's been a few weeks, okay? We'll talk about the ground that we've already covered, and I'll go through the scriptures with you. Oz will put them on the screen as we do that so you can see it with me. But this is where we started on that first Sunday after the resurrection, where the Lord came in and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this was a fulfillment of something that he had promised earlier in his ministry. So in John chapter 7, and this is where he promised it, John chapter 7, verses 39, 37 to 39, it says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried, cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, now he's been glorified. Here in John 20, he's been glorified in his death and in his resurrection. And so now, because that's happened, he can now impart the Holy Spirit to his disciples. So it's a fulfillment of what Jesus had promised. But there's a timing thing there. And John points that out in chapter 7, verse 39. Jesus was promising and prophesying that the Holy Spirit would be given to those who believe in him for their own personal forgiveness, just like we've been talking about already. And once that happens, then the Holy Spirit is given as a gift to those who believe. 
And he resides in us and he becomes the fountain of living water, the source of life. It's nothing less than the very life of Jesus himself coming into us. And when John is the only one who tells us here in chapter 20, he says that he breathed on him. John's the only apostle who tells us that, that he breathed on them. And it's highly significant because the word takes us back to the first time the word was ever used in the Bible. And that's back in Genesis 2, where God breathed into the man and he became a living soul when he created Adam. And John's using that word breathed again. But Jesus is breathing on men who are already living. So he's indicating that there's a new creation, a new life that comes from him for those who believe. And the Holy Spirit then is imparted by him to confirm this into your own soul. So Jesus stood up on that great day of the feast. So we learned from that. We learned from what Jesus had promised and what he fulfilled, that the Holy Spirit is given to those who are forgiven. That's the way I like to say it because it helps me remember it. The Holy Spirit is given to those who are forgiven through their faith in his death and resurrection. After we examined those scriptures, just as we've done, we then went to an example of how that works. And we went to John chapter 4, where Jesus had a conversation, hear me out, he had a conversation with a very thirsty woman. And that is, it was a woman who had had broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship. Five husbands that resulted in end of a marriage through death or divorce. Very painful. John chapter 4, that woman sort of became an example for us of how this works in real time. And Jesus famously said to that woman, that very thirsty woman, a woman who is thirsting for love. If any man is thirsty, what are you thirsting for? Well, I can tell you, you're thirsting for air and food and water. And those are just the essentials. But it's much, much deeper than that, amen? amen. We're thirsting for acceptance and respect and love and concern and compassion, mercy. That's what we're thirsting for because life is hard. And this woman is sort of the poster child for all that. And she comes and she meets Jesus at a well. She's there to draw water out of a deep well. And Jesus said, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Lord, give me that water. <laughs> Naturally, she said, right? And through that conversation, he reveals that he's the Messiah. And her whole life changed. Her whole life changed. We learned from that that the first and primary thing that the Holy Spirit does in the life of someone who has been forgiven and given the Holy Spirit is worship. That's the first and primary thing that a person does. Worship. Worship is the activity of glorifying God. Wayne Grudem. It's not my own, that's his. Give him credit. How do we glorify God? Robust prayer. Dogged obedience. Singing and serving and sacrificing. Fellowship and communion. Surrendering constantly to his great glory. That's how we do it. 
And that's what he takes so much delight in. The week after that, we went to John chapter 14, verses 16 to 18. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Again, prophetic. He will be in you. And that's what was fulfilled in John 20 after his death and resurrection when Jesus breathed on them. John 14, 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. So in that Sunday morning, we see that Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as our helper. I will give you another helper. And I want to stress this and remind ourselves that he's saying another, that means literally one just like me. And that's because God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so here's the Son saying, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, who is God, just like me. And you've, you've enjoyed the benefit of being my disciples for the last three years with my physical presence with you and the Holy Spirit being with you as he resides in me. But now I'm going to leave. And when I leave, everything's going to get much more intimate. And it's actually to your advantage that I leave. Because now the Holy Spirit, I will come into you, one just like myself. And so we examine that. I just want to say to you, brothers and sisters, we have Jesus in us by virtue of his Spirit being in us. Because I've believed. And he has breathed on me, so to speak, and on you. And so the Lord is in you, a helper, another helper. And we took some time to think about the word helper, and we came to realize that sometimes it's translated comforter or advocate or counselor. And helper is kind of a comprehensive title that encompasses all those. an advocate, a counselor, a comforter. Basically, he's our helper. <laughs> and I remind you that helper, it, it, just so we're clear, because it sort of sounds like, I can do this myself, but if you want to assist me, that's okay. No, it doesn't mean that at all, right? Because Jesus is God. The disciples came to a place that's like, Lord, we can't go without you any longer. It was such a blessing to sing, Lord, I need you today, wasn't it? And I'm just thinking, Lord, you're so delighted to hear the, 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 your saints express their dependence upon you. It was beautiful. I'm the vine, you're the branches. And here's all my branches calling out and saying, Lord, we need you. And we know that you provide and we thank you. You're our helper our comforter, counselor, and advocate. And then to help us see that in action, in real time, we went to John chapter 8, and we looked at that account of the woman who was caught in adultery. And her accusers had brought her to Jesus and said that she's deserving of death according to the law, but what do you say? And they've all got a stone in their hand, and they're ready to, to follow the law and to put this adulteress to death. And the Lord showed his compassion as he's got this woman, and it's, by the way, she's been, it told us, it's kind of graphic, honestly, it says she was caught in the very act, and so she's dragged out of this bed, and she's dragged out into the public square. I don't know. She was even clothed. And there's, and these men interrupted the Lord while he's teaching. There's a big crowd of people. That woman 
just human nature is to crumple, just to crumble down. She no doubt just was like covering and head down and weeping, so ashamed. Everything's been brought into the light. And it says the Lord stooped down. He got right down to her level, comforting her. He's letting her know, her, I'm for you. I'm not against you. Just his body language, it was clearly saying that. She maybe peeked out from and, and could just sense that he was with her. And her accusers, holding these stones and demanding he obey the law. And he advocates on her behalf. Which one of you is without sin? Go ahead and throw a stone. And they're like, well, I'm disqualified. <laughs> and so they all dropped the rocks and off they went. Very, very clear. When that's all said and done, the only one who could judge her was the one without sin, who stooping down next to her, his advocate, he advocates for her. And then he addresses her personally. Where's your accusers? There's none. I don't accuse you either. Now go and sin no more, her counselor. You're forgiven and freed from death. Continue in life and freedom that I've given you. I wish we knew the rest of that story, but I think we already do. She worshiped. She went out. She put her clothes on. And she worshiped God through Jesus, who was her helper. And her life changed. Her lifestyle changed. Her priorities changed. Her perspective, her decisions changed. She said, I'm not going to do that anymore because I love the one who loved me and set me free. You don't need a law for that. Love is the fulfillment of the law. So that's what we've talked about already. I got about 15 minutes to go through what I want to talk to you about today. So go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. And you're going to see in these two verses... The Holy Spirit is mentioned as the one who seals us and guarantees our inheritance. He's our, his presence in your life, he's the sealer and the guarantor. <laughs> I think you can say it that way. All right. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation... And believed in him, that is Jesus, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? So the presence of the Holy Spirit, which we now understand, right? That when I'm forgiven, I'm given the Holy Spirit. And he causes me to worship Jesus, with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind, right? And uh, he's my helper. The Holy Spirit is my helper. But something that happens that you may not know, because until Paul, thankfully, is inspired by the Spirit to reveal to us that the Holy Spirit in you also is a sealer and a guarantee of a future inheritance. It says, in him... That is in Christ. By the way, it was pointed out to me in some study this week that uh, somebody has established that that little phrase in him or in Jesus Christ, it's used exclusively by Paul some hundreds of times 
And there's, there's a deep theology just around those two little words, in him. I'm united with him in his death. I'm united with him in his resurrection. There, there's a deep relationship. In him indicates salvation, transformation, and satisfaction. I mean, I could go on with more words, but we're in Christ and Christ is in me. And again, I, I draw on the Lord's very own analogy or the metaphor of I'm the vine, you're the branch. Thank you, Lord. I can, I can get a picture of that or I can go to a, one of our local vineyards, there's so many, and I can actually see it. And fruit comes out of that branch as it's attached to the vine through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's beautiful. But Paul tells us that in him, when we're in him, and he says, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, so there's a response to the gospel. You're a sinner. Jesus died for your sin. He's offering you eternal life. Confess, repent, and believe, and you'll be saved. Amen. This is the gospel. Straightforward. He goes, when that happens, you receive the Holy Spirit. You were sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. When was the Holy Spirit promised? I, there's, there's so many times. In Isaiah, some of the prophets. In Isaiah, multiple times. In Joel, <laughs> right? Um, Peter quoting there on the day of Pentecost how Joel prophesied, I will pour out my spirit in the last days, Joel 2.28, right? But also the greatest prophet of born of men, John the Baptist. He said, look, people, I'm baptizing with water. There's one coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It was prophesied. Jesus himself in the upper room with the disciples in John 14, 15, and 16 promised this Holy Spirit. And it's so precious here because Paul, he says, when you heard, previous to that, he'd been talking about when we believed. He was saying that God's chosen people, the Jew, we have believed. The church started in Jerusalem, but now Paul's writing to a church in Turkey, <laughs> primarily Gentile, a church in Ephesus. And he's saying the gospel wasn't just for the Jew, it's for all men. Jesus' death, he died for the sin of all people. He goes, and now you've believed to the glory of God, and you were sealed. Sealed. So it's sealed and guaranteed. I just want to point this out to you, okay? Sealed is um, Paul's using a very common thing that would happen in uh, the world of commerce. So if you had an item that was being a commodity, for example, maybe a sack of grain, and you were selling it at the market, or maybe had to transport it via some sort of transport ship even, you would seal it, right? And that would identify it as your own. It's sealed. It's identified as to the owner. The seal identifies it to, as it belongs to the owner. Am I making myself clear? I hope. Sealed identifies ownership. Sealed also, there's other ways this word is used in the New Testament. If you think about uh, Matthew, uh, when Jesus was put into the tomb, they pushed a rock in front of the mouth of the cave, and they took a, some hot wax and they sealed it, right? So it, it was used for security purposes, right? Uh, in Revelation, John hears some voices from heaven, and the Lord said to him, seal it up and do not write it down. All right, seal it up, do not write it down. So whatever it was that was said to John, it was sealed, that it was hidden away safely and not to be revealed yet. So that word sealed can be used to, uh, to secure, to hide safely, to identify. You know, there's that interesting thing in Revelation 7 where there's 144,000 Jews who all get sealed on their forehead. So some angel comes along and he's got this ink horn or something and he puts a mark on the forehead of these, of these men. And so they are marked by God. But that's so important because it, it declares identity and ownership. 
And it also, in John, in Revelation 9, it says they're, they're spared from judgment. As creatures come out of this bottomless pit and horrible stuff starts to happen and they're commanded, don't touch the ones with the mark. And so when the Holy Spirit seals us, we're identified as belonging to God and we're spared from judgment. Oh yeah, we're going to die. Well, maybe we'll get raptured. I don't know. That's another conversation. <laughs> which I'm very happy to have with you, <coughs> right? But I'll, I'll never face the judgment I deserve for all the bad stuff I've done. Never. Because that was transferred to Jesus, and I've transferred his forgiveness to me by faith. And when that happened, I'm sealed, secured, identified, protected, hidden away safely. Isn't that what Paul said in Colossians? You have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Are you, are you sealed? Are you secure <laughs> in your future? Do you know that for yourself? Has the Holy Spirit borne witness to you, brother and sister? Friend, that I know he's my savior. I know it. I may not even have the words to understand how to express that, but I know that he's forgiven me. This was my own testimony, as I've shared with you before. An irreligious, untaught man at 24 years old. And when the Lord revealed my forgiveness to me, sovereignly revealed it to me. I didn't have words to tell you what just happened. I had no Bible language. I had no doctrine. I just knew that I was forgiven. And it wasn't subjective, subjective euphoric, some construct. It was real. It was the Holy Spirit it had sovereignly entered my life. And I knew I was forgiven. And I immediately said, Father, thank you. I was in a relationship immediately, and I knew it. And how do you know? How do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? Your life has changed. You have a desire to read the Word, and it's nourishment to your soul. And you have a desire to honor God and to love Him because He's loved us first. Or as one man said so simply and profoundly, how do you know if you're a Christian? Christ-loving self-loathing. And it's not in a depressive sort of, oh, it's just that I know I can't depend on myself. There is no righteousness in me. Not at the standard of perfection that God has and is. He's holy. I'm not. But he gives me his holiness. He is, after all, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said of himself, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. So Jesus himself said that, John 6, 27. He says, I've been sealed. And he refers to it sort of eris tense, so it's something that has already happened, and most of us understand that it happened at his baptism. When the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and the Father's voice said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So in, in the context here, Jesus is saying, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. God has certified and authorized me to give eternal life to all who will lay down their desire to earn it through works and receive it by grace. I don't know, I was thinking of maybe, a, 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 what is, there a, is there an example <laughs> of this ceiling, of this mark that comes upon a Christian? And the best thing I could come up with was that example in the Old Testament 
of a man who had indentured himself out to because of bankruptcy and he became the servant of another man for six years. On the seventh year, he's allowed to go free. But there was a little interesting stipulation that on that seventh year, when the man has worked off his debt, he's allowed to go free. But if the man says to his master, I love my master, then his master shall bring him to God and he will put, and he'll pierce his ear. <laughs> and he'll put an earring in him. And it's the mark of his identification, that I'm not going free. I'm going to serve my master for the rest of my life because he's been a good master. I love him. He loved me first. And so there's that identification kind of a thing, that seal. It was a physical thing. What Jesus, what Paul's talking about here is a spiritual thing. It's internal, but it's known by God because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. And then Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. Well, it's just what it means. Guarantee. A down payment. A pledge. A deposit. Y'all paid deposits before? <laughs> right? Do you have to give a deposit to Cornell before you get there? Yes. Jabez is going yes. Is it pretty substantial? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How do you know? You didn't pay a penny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I don't even know that about you, but Jabez is such a good-natured guy, I can say that out loud. All right? The point is this, right? A substantial thing was given as an installment, right? As a deposit, as a pledge. Guess what? He's going to show up. Because you're not going to waste that, right? It's a guarantee. It's a guarantee. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance, Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. When we have Jesus, when we have the Holy Spirit in us, we've got heaven on earth. Obviously, in some very, very small, identifiable way. <laughs> Other than the, the grace and the peace and the joy and the love, that the fruit that is in our lives, right? But it's also... <laughs> all these other weeds grow up around us and from inside of us. And there's lots of problems and issues. But someday, what'd Paul say? When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Now I know in part, but then I'll know even as I am known. I look in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. I was a child. I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but there was a transition. When I became a man, I put away childish things. He's talking about going to heaven. And the Holy Spirit is the guarantee. That deposit, that first installment, a relationship is established. If you just think of it on the terms of a transaction, I don't know, I got, I heard a story years ago of a man who loved vintage cars, right? 57 Chevy, right? Year I was born. So it was a pretty hot model back in those days, right? And people who have restored those back to their original, they're worth a lot of money. And so if you're in the market for a vintage 5770, right? And some dude's got one for sale for $75,000 and you go, I want to buy it, right? And you go, okay. And he's like, great. You're going to need a guarantee, a deposit, a first installment. I understand that. So here's a hundred bucks. Is that convincing? On a $75,000 car? Not at all. That guy can walk away from 100 bucks in a heartbeat. But if he said, look, here's, here's $49,000, and I'll be back with the remainder. Now, the seller's convinced. This dude ain't walking away from that. And a relationship is established between the buyer and the seller. Now, let's move out of the, the commercial world and go into the spiritual, the reality 
of our relationship with God. He's given us the Holy Spirit. I've given you myself. I'm not walking away from that. A relationship is established. The buyer, so to speak, is fully committed, is he not? And it also tells me something very, very cool, that he will return and he'll finish the job. Receiving the Holy Spirit, on the other side of it, it also obligates us as the ones who have been given this wonderful gift of the Spirit of Jesus, it also obligates us to keep what he's bought in good condition until he comes back. Amen? To keep it in good condition, to live a holy life, to do all the stuff that we've already talked about. The, the feet on the ground, bare necessity, the, the real life as a Christian, it's like, today was just not a good day. I don't know, what is it about that? I was thinking of that this week, because I don't know, I woke up on a, I think it was Monday morning, and it was like, I don't know, this day kind of sucked right from the beginning. I just woke up sort of like it was a minor key day. You know? I don't know why. And then you go back, was, what was I thinking? What was I looking at before I went to sleep? I was watching the basketball game. <laughs> yeah. The heat, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Receiving the Holy Spirit obligates us to keep that which he has purchased set apart for him and to keep it in good condition until he returns. And it gives us that idea that he is actually going to come back. And I know that because he lives in me and he tells me that. I'm yours. The Holy Spirit seals us and he guarantees our inheritance. You know, I, I think about all this, and I'll just wrap this up, but... Um, Again, I, I, I'm, I was like, Lord, is there, is there a physical, real-life example of this gift of the Holy Spirit who seals and guarantees, identifies and promises, basically? And I thought, you know, the perfect example is an engagement ring, <laughs> right? And we see it in Genesis where uh, this Guy falls in love with a girl, her name is Dinah, and she happens to be the sister of the 12 Jacob's kids, right? And this guy, he says, uh, make the price for the bride and the gift I am to bring as great as you like, and I will pay whatever you ask, only give me the girl as a wife. <laughs> and that's perfect, it's in keeping with Jewish custom where the man would show up to the perspective and he would give something that would establish a relationship and she, having received that, would then take herself off the market. <laughs> I'm no longer available. I belong to him. And someday he'll come back and he'll get me and we will live together happily ever after <laughs> or until death do us part. <laughs> right? But how does she know that? He's giving her a gift. He's giving her something tangible. In our culture, it's a wing. It's an engagement ring. Right? Back in that culture, there was similar things. There was an unnamed servant who went to get a bride for Isaac. Genesis 24, the famous story, right? Rebecca. And the servant prays, and Rebecca answers the prayer. She doesn't even know it. And then the servant gives her gifts. Puts a nose ring on her nose and a bracelet on her bracelet. And all of a sudden she's identified and, and set apart. And then that servant brings her to Isaac and, and they're married. So that's, I love that because that's how the Bible ends. With that very sort of analogy in Revelation 22... The Spirit and the Bride, which is the church, who's been given the Holy Spirit as that guarantee that I'm His. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. 
let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life come. Let's stand and we'll pray. An invitation to you was just made from the Word of God in Revelation 22 and what you've heard here this morning from Ephesians, an invitation has been made to you to come. You're thirsty. But the Lord promises to fill you with His life. Confess and you will be saved. Father, we thank You for the ministry of Your Spirit among us and in us deeply today. Thank you, Lord. You are glorious to us. We thank you for your work among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. For those of you who will... Now I remember what I was going to say. <laughs> Val's been working hard to put together a list of names of those of you who are graduating this year. So please come back next week. Uh, we just want to pray over you and send you out into your respective mission field, wherever that takes you. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll do that next Sunday. Uh, the rest of you, I presume, may or may not be back. So we look forward to seeing you in the fall. All right, blessings.